Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Florent Corvedier. I'm a customer success manager here at Pantino. Uh, and today we wanted to discuss the challenges and changes the media and publishing industry has faced over the last few years. So that's why I have uh, the great pleasure uh, today to be joined by Associate Marketing Director at Ringier, uh, Gavin Forsyth. So hello, Gavin, and welcome. How are you? Hi, Florent. Thank you. It's great to, great to be here. Cool. Perfect. Um, can you tell us a bit more about yourself? Sure. So, yeah, as uh, you mentioned, I'm the uh, Associate Marketing Director at uh, Ringia Agia. Um, originally hailing from, from Cape Town, but in, in Berlin these days. Uh, I have uh, about 10 years, uh, a little over 10 years in experience in, in digital, uh, but also along the way picking up the full 360 de degree range of, of channels as well. Um, and yeah, last year I'd say I'm really passionate about marketing tech and, and innovation. Thank you, Gavin. So happy to have you with us today. So before we dive into our subject, I just wanted to give you a quick overview of Ringier for those who might not know this company just yet. Uh, so Ringier is a major European media company with a portfolio including around 130 subsidiaries in the print, media, entertainment, and e-commerce sectors, and leading online marketplaces. So you might know them from their renowned and uh, exceptional journalism, high editorial content, and digital development. So today, uh, Gavin generously offered to share his insights and experience. Um, so I'll ask him a few questions to help us understand how can company constantly adapt to an economy where audiences evolve as quickly as the world changes. And uh, at the end of the discussion, we'll also have a short Q&A session uh, in case you'd like to ask your own questions to Gavin. So feel free to use the chat as we progress through the webinar and we'll pick up a few questions to discuss at the end. Um, so Gavin, to start with, I'd love to give our audience a bit more of context about Ringier's background and current setup. Could you describe what your role entails and what your work is mainly focused on, please? Sure. So as you mentioned, Ringier is made up of uh, various groups and subsidiaries and companies over 130. Uh, so I think it's fair to point out uh, my team and I aren't working on every single one of those. Um, we're, we're working on a few core brands, uh, generally the ones wholly owned by, by Ringia. Um, and within that, working on marketing tech uh, solutions. Uh, so what does this mean? So my team and I are responsible for uh, developing tactics and strategies we, we believe are going to have big impact. Uh, and then from those strategies, uh, finding solutions, tech solutions out in the market that uh, meet those the, the, the criteria we've set for those, those strategies. Um, and if we can't find those solutions, uh, building it ourselves. Uh, so, you know, one signal is, a, is an example of a solution we found that does meet our needs for particular tactics. Uh, but we do have a, an in-house uh, software engineering team that build a lot of things for my team and I as well. Um, and then to kind of encapsulate all of that, uh, right now the team is focused on uh, sort of email, browser push, social media, uh, with a couple of other branches out here and there. But those those three are kind of our main focuses from a, a marketing tech and solutions point of view right now. And so you mentioned developing tactics that you believe would drive the most impact. I really would like to focus on push notification here. <clears throat> Be one of the easiest and most effective tool to engage with users. So can you explain the role that push notification play in your current strategy? So really think of push notifications fulfilling two main roles. The, the first one we consider it as a, a supplement to transactional messaging. So this is quite broad ranging, but transactional messaging is is defined as a user user triggered. So very common transactional message would be something like a password reset. So what I mean by supplementing this, a good example is uh, supplementing the email channel is if an if a email hard bounces, we may want to try another channel uh, to try and contact that user to update their, their email. So that's kind of a, an example of, of 
uh, transactional and what we mean by supplementing transactional uh, communications. Uh, the second, which of course is the more interesting and more exciting and probably the one we're here to talk about today, um, is driving user outcomes. Um, and I want to point out, I've, I've selected those words carefully because it's not just marketing campaigns. User outcomes encompasses a lot more than that. It's everything that's not transactional in nature. So uh, a very easy to understand example of that is uh, a reactivation type strategy. It's not necessarily a marketing campaign. You're not selling anything, but you are driving user outcomes that benefit the marketing, uh, marketing goals. And when you are talking about outcomes, what time of outcomes are you looking to, to achieve, for example? So for our businesses, we really look to build tangible outcomes uh, that drive value to the, to the business and to the user. So for a, a media brand, uh, put another way, a publisher, uh, something like page views uh, would, would be a, a good outcome we look for uh, that's valuable to the business um, and uh, with the caveat of, of course that uh, there's a decent time on site there's no point in driving tons of page views if people bounce off the page immediately uh, so that's kind of an example of value for the business page views value for the user time on site um, in some of our other businesses in the marketplace side and the classified side uh, could be things like leads or, or, or registrations. Um, so I think here, yeah, um, you know, user value versus brand value is, is really important. Um, you want to drive both. Um, so I think important to understand what's what's the, the revenue drivers, or at least at, at the top of the funnel for those brands, what their revenue drivers might be, and ensuring you're able to, uh, while driving user value, also driving business value. And, and I think that's very interesting. And, and when we talk about, you know, finding efficient ways to drive business results and leverage push or any form of messages to help reach those goals, um, my next question would be, you know, even before being able to generate this value, uh, value, we all know that, you know, user has so many ways to access information today. So how do you manage to capture your audience attention in this highly competitive landscape? Exactly, that, that, that's a great question. So the biggest keyword for me that springs to mind is, is relevance um, in everything we do. So at, at a very high level, what that means is uh, don't blast everything to everyone. Uh, but I think hopefully as marketers, we're long past, we're long past, past that. Um, other things that are important to us is managing user expectations up front. This is a, a term we often use within businesses with, with each other, uh, but it's true for users as well. So uh, a big mistake I see a lot of brands doing is they will, they will trigger the, the native prompt for, for browser notifications immediately the second a user visits the site if they haven't opted in already. Uh, and that's a huge mistake because if the users click block, you're done with that user. You're, you're not speaking to them again on, on that device. Uh, so for, for me, getting the user to trigger a prompt, the native prompt, um, and at that point also communicating to the user what they're going to be receiving, what why we want this, this opt-in. Uh, so already by the time they've opted in, uh, they know what they're going to be receiving um, and, and you've kind of then already created a bit of value for them in that. Um, but going further into that driving value for the user, so I've touched on this already before, uh, but I think creating that uh, that trend or, or that repertoire with the user that they start associating your brand with uh, with quality content. So when they're being peppered with uh, a million notifications a day, the one which has your brand name attached to is going to stick out because they know that's the one where I, I clicked on that yesterday and it was a really great article. I'm going to click on it again today. So building up that, that reputation um, and that association of quality with your brand really helps. Uh, yeah, and I totally agree. I mean, um, most of the discussions that I have with uh, my other customer is, you know, how to drive that value and driving value being key here. So I'm sure our attendees today would love to understand how you manage to achieve it. Can you share like a few tricks and tips that you would recommend to ensure that you can appeal to, you know, a large and diverse audience? Of course. So without giving too much away, um, 
and a, a great example is, is is a mass market publisher, right? They're they're uh, creating content on anything from from sport to to celebrity gossip to serious news. So you know, in that sense, there's a diverse audience with diverse interests. Uh, so in one word, and I think everyone kind of knows this is coming. Uh, segmentation is super important here. Um, so so very important to to build you know, what I would term mean, meaningful segments, not just segments for the sake of segments, uh, segments which really differentiate content um, and user intent uh, would, would be the biggest uh, objective here. And just a quick focus on this. So can you give us like an example of uh, what you would consider a meaningful segment to you or, or share perhaps a segmentation that was uh, particularly successful for your team? Sure. So the count function uh, or tags is my favorite tool to use in, in OneSignal. So uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, it basically lets you tag a user at multiple times every time they visit a page with that tag. Um, and you'll have that count uh, within the tag section on that user. Uh, so this allows you to gauge the uh, not just that the user is interested in politics, for example, uh, but that the user is either very interested in politics or not that interested in politics, maybe compared to some of their other interests. So it's giving you a bit of a uh, an insight there. Um, and from there, you can then really tweak it quite nicely in the segment builder because uh, for those of you who are familiar with the, with building segments using tags, uh, you can then have uh, you know the the segment of the tag name is greater than or is less than, um, and then you can really play with that number. So it kind of hands the control back to the marketer to then you know adjust the segment as necessary. One of the the core cool things I I try and do when I'm briefing things into my uh, uh, my software engineering team is building things in a way that I hand control back to the marketers, that I'm not having to go back to them every time we change strategy or tactics. So this particular tag type really does that um, for, for the marketers. And so, you know, to give a practical example, you know, shifting from country to country or brand to brand, the definition of what we might want or the threshold rather, let's say, we'd want the user to cross for that tag to enter the segment would, would of course always be different. And potentially through the life of the business would be changing over time. Uh, so the biggest trick there is using that, but then for yourselves figuring out the balance. Because of course, the higher you make the threshold, the smaller the segment size. And as marketers, of course, we wanna get it to the most relevant people as well. So you find this balance between how big can I get the segment without making it too uh, unrelevant for the users in that segment? Um, and you might use things like uh, a CTR, a, a click-through rate to, to determine that. And um, I mean, I think we are talking about the very um, crucial and interesting uh, metrics and tactics here. Like, for example, you mentioned CTR, you mentioned segmentation, um, and that circles back to, you know, driving value. So I'd be very curious to know what are the key data that you're looking when you're creating a, a new tactic, for example? So unsurprisingly, we're, we're of course, looking for what's gonna make the most impact. Uh, so from a from a content selection point of view, we have a lot of data points um, of uh, page views and other things indicating what content is popular. So if we're wanting to drive uh, a lot of uh, sessions, traffic to the site, um, we, we, we can look at that. Um, but alternatively, in terms of uh, figuring out a tactic, uh, also looking at uh, you know the full channel mix and, and where where certain areas are performing poorly, where they aren't meeting their targets. Um, so you know if a particular transactional email or even a campaign type email uh, is not performing well, certainly then perhaps testing whether a, a browser notification as an alternative would, would do would do better. I think the the biggest advantage browser notifications or, or just push notifications in general have uh, is that they're they're immediate in nature. Uh, so an example I might give here, I'll pull from a, a property classifieds. Uh, 
you know, in, in a very competitive market. So I live in Berlin, the property market here is uh, extremely competitive. Uh, and a user looking for a property, they've set up some alerts. They want to they want to know immediately when the new property has been listed for, for, for rent or, or for sale, if you're in the market to buy. Um, and, you know, depending on, on your criteria, that could be 10 to 20 alerts a day. Uh, in an email context, you would be spammed almost immediately if you tried to do that. You can't send that many emails. Uh, and so here, push really has an advantage. So that's kind of one way of, uh, you know, how push might uh, uh, sneak into some of the tactics that we're, we're considering from a, you know, from a larger uh, communications perspective. And um, I think the, 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 the notion of timing is very important then. Uh, here when, when you're trying to find where you can uh, make the most uh, impact. Like you said, that's again, I think the big topic today is uh, the notion of value and how you can really demonstrate the ROI. Uh, being, because being able to show value is always key at, and at the center of any campaign really that you make because you, you need to, um, to make sure that what you're doing is driving um, impact, uh, positive impact on, on your business. So, um, my next question would be more around, you know, the KPIs. What are the main KPIs you take into consideration to evaluate your campaign ROI and make sure that you're getting value out of it? It will vary from, from business to business, but I think it's fair to say almost all digitally focused businesses, it really comes down to sessions. At the very least, at the top of the on-site funnel, everything starts with sessions. Uh, sure, uh, it's up to the site and maybe some other uh, pieces of communication uh, to transform those into leads, registrations, newsletter signups, whatever your, your, your goals are. But I think, you know, when, when considering uh, the impact of, of a campaign or a tactic that's using uh, browser push, um, sessions is, is super important. Uh, and in terms of reporting, um, it really comes down to, to, to CTR because, of course, segment sizes vary. Um, and especially, you know, if you've, if you've built a brand new segment and it's still getting momentum, users are still getting tagged. Um, it may not be uh, driving sessions from day one, which is certainly not what, what we expect from that kind of a, a tactic. Uh, so I think a, a kind of a tip there is also looking at CTR as, as an early indicator. You know, I'm only maybe kicking off. I'm only maybe pushing to 100 users a day. Um, but what is the click rate? If, you know, if no one's clicking, then we have a problem uh, early on and we can identify that. So I think those, those two things are, are really what I'm looking at uh, to, to start with. And, and I, I can imagine that obviously, you know, there is this strategy refinement and development can't happen like overnight. So my question to you would be, how long did it take to optimize those current strategies for, for you and your team? I would say uh, my strategies or my tactics are never optimized. Um, it really comes down to, uh, I think, a, a testing culture that every digital team should really have. Uh, the second you you kind of say, cool, this, this tactic is optimized. We can put that aside now and focus elsewhere. You've almost given up on that tactic you know, in this industry. Even within one signal, there, there, there are new features and, and new things all the time. Um, we should constantly be asking the question of uh, what can we do differently, what can we do better? Um, but basically, yeah, to, to answer your original question, uh, I would say uh, it's three years and counting. Thanks. And, and just a quick follow-up on that. So how often should you conduct tests, like in your opinion? There's no single correct answer for, for that. Uh, I, I guess the the only answer is is as often as possible um, within reason. Uh, so you know, for me, th there's a couple factors that, that come into play here. Um, one, the actual practicality of of running tests. Uh, you need a certain amount of data uh, for it to be statistically significant, and and you can then draw uh, reliable conclusions from. So depending how much data you're gathering or what sort of portion of your site, if it's not that busy, uh, it might necessitate quite a long test. Uh, 
and, and I say this is important because a lot of times you can't have your tests overlapping. They're going to interfere with each other. So depending on how much or how fast you can gather data, that's going to be a, a limitation on how often you can test. Uh, and the other thing I, I think is very important is creating sort of peaceful benchmark periods between tests. Back-to-back uh, -back tests are not a good idea either. So with that in mind, and then also then with, uh, you know, really comes down to uh, what kind of resources you have access to. A lot of times tests will need a software engineer or someone to help you out. Um, so with those two constraints, um, you know, for us, it kind of boils down to ideally one per month, uh, but yeah, can, can vary greatly. Thank you, Gavin. And I've got one last question for you before we open up the attendee Q&A. So do you foresee any big industry trend or maybe shifts in the coming years? So I'm going to cheat a little bit here because I think foresee uh, maybe maybe implies that, that I'm seeing something everybody else isn't. Uh, I think a lot of these the things that come to mind are just starting or, or have been going for a while. But I think these there, there are a couple of things that come to mind which I think are are important to consider going forward because there are trends which are in their infancy. So uh, I think uh, one which is quite mature but still got some way to go, especially in this particular uh, channel, is more granular segmentation. Um, you know, right now we have some tagging ability and and as I mentioned, some some like uh, tag counts to to play with. Um, but I think. Uh, being able to to more granularly target users uh, is still the the goal of a one to one communication. Uh, you know, tailor made content uh, for that specific user is still not quite there. Um, and I think segmentation can get us a bit or better segmentation than what the technology currently allows can definitely get us there. However. Uh, to, to further that, I think the, the biggest thing, which is the, the big thing everyone's talking about now is, is machine learning, uh, but particularly for us in terms of content selection. Um, because segmentation is only going to take you so far. Uh, so, and, and even then, so think about, say, I, I do get my granular segmentation right, and I now have a thousand segments in one signal. There, there is no way a human can, can service those. So you're going to need some kind of um, in machine learning or, or to know what content to select for all thousand um, and which kind of leads me to my to my final point here uh, and, and you can kind of see that all kind of tied together is, is automation right there's no point in having machine learning if you can't tie it in with some kind of automation so you know you can select great content uh, but you need some kind of intelligence um, in terms of automation of uh, getting it to the users without relying on some poor human to send a thousand messages a day to each segment. Thank you for your insights. I, I really like the, the concept, uh, I mean, your concept around uh, granular, uh, granular, sorry, segmentation, machine learning and automation. And I completely agree with you. Those would be, you know, crucial to consider and, and even master in the, in the years to come. Um, so I guess that's it. Thank you so much for your time. Um, I'd like to open now the Q&A for our attendee if they have any questions they'd like to, to ask you. So don't be shy. Um, for, for those who join us today, don't be shy. Just uh, feel free to ask any questions that you have uh, for Gavin. Um, we'd be more than happy to, to answer it. So you can use the chat uh, in the um, question um, section uh, and uh, submit our question, uh, your question to us. And uh, I'm just checking. No one so far, don't be shy. I've got one. Um, so one question is, so GDPR is a constantly evolving topic at the moment. So how do you make sure you can keep up and comply with the data protection and how does it affect your strategy? It's a great question. It's a, a, a topic, an ongoing topic in, in the organization um, at the moment. I think we, we certainly take a very cautious approach. Uh, a lot of the, 
the thing specified there and, and, and I'll probably put uh, privacy shield, uh, I'll, I'll bunch that together as well. Um, I think the, the biggest thing for us is uh, not putting user data into one signal um, until we, we're sure that it's not leaving the EU. Um, this is more, more legal talk, that's not really, really tactics. Um, but of course, uh, as some of you may know, OneSignal uh, now do in fact have EU data servers. Um, so we are actually in the pro process of now putting some things in place because having the ability to link uh, player IDs with a user ID then means our systems can do a lot more. Uh, we have a lot more information about who that user is and, and what kind of information uh, they might find valuable. Um, it also becomes more easy for them to sort of manage preferences on our site uh, when we can link it to, to or link their account to a device. So in terms of tactics, uh, these things are kind of that I mentioned now aren't really driving necessarily uh, business value, except for the fact that we're not going to go to jail, um, but it's more driving uh, user value. It's making interacting with our sites easier, controlling their preferences easier, um, and hopefully down the line, um, we can also start using that that that, uh, that data uh, to, to drive better value for the users. Thank you. And I'm conscious of the time. We are already uh, uh, one minute past, but maybe we can have one last question. So one question was, what is the most successful example of a campaign that you've run? The most successful example. I need to phrase these or pick my words carefully uh, as to not give too much private information away. Um, I think I, I, I can disclose that uh, uh, we have built our own content distribution engine. So it's difficult to replicate if, if, if you don't have a, a software engineering team, um, but pair, pairing the content distribution engine uh, with uh, the uh, tag-based counting uh, segments that I described earlier um, has probably been one of the most successful we, we, we've done to date um, because we're able to, to push out, um, as I alluded to before, a lot more content than what a human could do manually. But because of the segmentation, users are only getting a couple notifications a day. So they're not being bombarded. We're, we're not blasting everything to everyone. Uh, so I think it's a nice example of like the early days of some very basic machine learning or some automation uh, paired with some very basic segmentation. Uh, but I really see that going a lot, a lot further in, in the future. Thank you, Gavin. And that concludes our webinar for today. Uh, so thank you very much, Gavin, for uh, your insight and sharing your experience today with our audience. Uh, very much appreciated. So happy to have you again uh, today. And for you who watched the webinar, thank you so much for attending as well. Uh, we'll send a follow-up email so that you can watch the recording if you want to. And uh, yeah, I hope that was helpful, insightful, and that um, you know more about you know how to drive value in the media and publishing industry now. And you kind of have like a, a good um, grasp at what other company can do, such as uh, Ringy. So I hope that was... Uh, a good topic for uh, you to watch discuss. Thank you very much. Have a nice day and uh, speak soon. Bye.